It's time now for perspective. Arctic wildfires are on the rise, and so too is the amount of carbon dioxide they're churning into the atmosphere. In fact, this year, the amount of CO2 emitted by the fires is already 35% higher than the figure for the whole of 2019. To get a better idea of the implications of those figures, we can speak now with our guest today, Thomas Smith, who's an assistant professor in environmental geography at the London School of Economics. Thank you very much indeed for speaking to us here on France 24. Now, when many people think of the Arctic, they think of ice and rock, but clearly that's not the whole picture. What sort of climate are we talking about here and how is it changing? Well, the climate is warming uh, in the high Arctic three times faster than the rest of the planet. And um, what we've seen over the, this year and, and in 2019 as well is very unusually warm temperatures. Uh, so unusually warm that in some places the temperatures have been 20 degrees higher than the long term average. There's been a heat wave in eastern Siberia that started in the late winter and continued through the spring and the summer. And what we've seen is unprecedented levels of uh, fire activity um, in the satellite record. The carbon dioxide emissions in 2019 and 2020 put together um, were larger than the previous 16 years on record. So 2019 and 2020 have been very unusual years insofar as the fire activity driven by this longer term warming and the heat wave uh, that we've seen in these parts of the Arctic. Now, this year's fires are producing a significant amount more carbon dioxide than last year. How should we understand this spike? Is it simply that the fires are burning stronger and for longer? Well, the satellites up in space detect the heat from the fires. And the amount of heat that they detect is proportional to how much is burning on the ground. And we can use that to give us a really good idea of how much CO2 is being produced, not just carbon dioxide, but other greenhouse gases and uh, the pollution that's responsible for poor air quality. But carbon dioxide, it's not necessarily a problem if the forests and the grasslands in these regions are allowed to regenerate. When they regrow, when the grasses regrow, when the trees regrow, they'll re-sequester that carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. But the real question here is whether these forests are going to regenerate or not. If the fires are becoming more frequent and more intense, and that is what the evidence suggests, it might be that the forests are not able to regenerate to their full size or even not to a forest. It may be replaced by a grassland or a shrubland. And if that's the case, that is a problem because the carbon dioxide released from these fires will stay in the atmosphere. And as there far as you know, sorry to interrupt, as far as you know, is there any regional will to help with this uh, reforesting of the region? Are governments talking about this as an urgent issue? I think the scale of the problem is, is really difficult to comprehend. I'm currently working on a, an assessment of exactly how much area has burnt this year in the Arctic Siberia. And it is on a scale that simply would um, be unfeasible for um, any single nation state to um, have any kind of meaningful action so far as active regeneration of all of the forests that have been affected by this. What we need to look at is how we can do something about the future fires in this region, which can only get worse with the climate change that is locked in for the next few decades. And what we need to look at is what is causing the ignitions of these fires. In many cases, it might be human activity. And if we can stop those ignitions, that might um, improve the situation. But ultimately, to avoid larger scales in this region, especially in the forests and the tundra region to the north, we need to be thinking about mitigating greenhouse gases now and as soon as possible. But the effects of that will only be felt by the middle of this century or even later. And could you tell me a little bit about the role that peat bogs in the Arctic have to play in all this? Yeah, absolutely. This is something that, um, is, is what, that I'm very interested in. Around half of these fires in the boreal forest region and the tundra to the north, which is kind of a shrubland uh, where tree it's too cold and too far north, not much sunlight for, for trees to grow. About half of these fires are burning on peat bogs. So peat bogs contain carbon rich soil that has accumulated for thousands and thousands of years and is stored underground in boggy conditions or frozen conditions. And what we've seen in 2019 and 2020 is that the, the frozen land has thawed out because of the extra heat. And not only has it thawed out, but it has dried out. And at the surface where these fires are burning, the shrubs and the forest, we're seeing the soil ignited as well. 
And once the soil has ignited, it can smolder for days or weeks and in some cases even months and produces a lot of smoke. And all of that carbon that was contained in the soil that has been there for thousands of years is released into the atmosphere. And that's, that will certainly drive climate change. It's just like burning fossil fuels. And just how concerned should the environmental community be by this huge spike in CO2 emissions, emissions sorry, coming from the Arctic especially? Well, we know the Arctic is very sensitive to both the direct effects of human-caused climate change, but then there are these extra feedback loops, the indirect, indirect effects as well. This is an example of one where global warming as a result of greenhouse gases is driving the burning of peat bogs, the, the removal of boreal forests, and that can only drive more climate change. So it accelerates climate change. And there are a number of other mechanisms in the Arctic that can drive this as well. And we know the peat bogs are drying out. And as they dry out, they decompose and they also release carbon dioxide. So the Arctic is very much sending us a signal. It's, um, it's a canary in the coal mine. It's a warning sign that's telling us that um, what is happening up here as a sign of things to come for the rest of the planet. And I think we really should be heeding that warning signal. And I think, I worry I may know your answer already, but do you think there is still time to reverse the warming trends we have been seeing in the Arctic? Um, well, as I mentioned, uh, the warming trends are going to continue for a number of decades. We can't really do much about that because whatever we do now, the actions that we do now, as far as greenhouse gases are concerned, take decades um, for, to have an effect because of the um, slow reaction times in the climate system uh, between the oceans and the atmosphere and the ice on our planet. But if we can meet the targets that were set at the, at the Paris Agreement, if we can uh, collective, have some collective action to meet those targets for net zero by the middle of this century, we can avoid the, the worst that could be happening by the end of the century. Uh, things are going to get worse, but um, there is a way to kind of slow that down and bring it back um, to the way things are today, maybe, uh, by the end of the century. Now, there is a report out today that we've been covering uh, in our bulletins, the WWF warning that we've lost 70% of the world's animal and fish populations in the last 50 years. How do you react to that sort of data? Though so all these headlines figure, these headline figures are, are shocking, and it's it's often very difficult. So it's the same with fires as well to separate the impact of climate change and what we call environmental change, which is other human activity like deforestation and fragmentation of habitats and the conversion of land for for cropland and things like this. It's the same for fires. It's very difficult often to ascribe climate as being the one driver of these problems. Um, often it's all of the other things put together, and when you add climate change with deforestation, with the pressures on the landscape, with human ignitions, then you see that um, it, it's a really complex story, which means there are going to have to be um, complex solutions to these problems. Thomas Smith, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us here on France 24. Thomas Smith, Assistant Professor in Environmental Geography at the London School of Economics there. Okay, thanks. A reminder now 